Good morning. I was just saying to the ushers a minute ago that 8 o'clock does not seem that early Monday through Saturday, but it seems, <laughs> it seems incredibly early on a Sunday for me for some reason. I don't know what that is. Um, welcome. And a very special welcome if you happen to be a visitor with us today. And if you're a first-time visitor with us, we'd be delighted to be able to welcome you. Um, if you'd be willing to stand up and introduce yourself, that's not a requirement, more of a request. But do we have any first-time visitors with us this morning? Okay, I'm going to jump into uh, the bulletin and... Um, just ask uh, you, well, those of you sitting in the pews closest to the Burgundy worship folders, or there by the folders, if you haven't already, go ahead and take those out. Begin to put your information in there. Um, the prayer request slips are in the folders, so if you have a prayer need, go ahead and fill one of those out. Hang on to it. Put it in the prayer box by the front doors uh, as you leave today. Um, also, if you'd like some private prayer with one of our prayer ministers at the conclusion of today's service, just gather here at the altar rail closest to the pulpit and someone will meet you there, greet you, and, and pray with you. We do want to extend our uh, Christian sympathies to the Berghofer family um, as they um, now grieve the death of Alice. Uh, Alice's memorial service will be Tuesday, October 11th, 1.30 p.m., here in the sanctuary, they ask in lieu of flowers, memorial gifts may be given or made to American Lutheran Church. Uh, no, a number of things in your bulletin, I'm just going to identify a few that you might be interested in. One is the pastor, pastor's prayer luncheon coming up on Tuesday, October 18th from noon to 1.30 p.m. If that's something you're interested in, please contact the church office. Um, I'm delighted to again report this week, I know we mentioned it last week, but that uh, the, due to your generosity, the full amount to pay for the organ repair has now been collected and we have scheduled time for people to come in and to begin that process, hoping for a completion date prior to Thanksgiving. We should pray about that. <laughs> You know how those things go. Um, but our hope is, is that we'll have everything all taken care of uh, by the busy Christmas season. Um, again, thank you so much for your generosity in making that happen. Um, altar flowers today, uh, given by Kate Howell in memory of Marilyn Hack and by the parish life staff in honor of uh, the pastors. Hi, Dee. Hello. Hi, Dee Ho. I'm fine. Somebody unplugged me, but I got, I got plugged back in. Did you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> in honor of Pastor Appreciation Month, we have a little thing. So uh, Don... Oh, a Pastor, little thing. A little thing. Don, Pastor Don, would you come up here with Pastor Jack and I? And Margie has something for you. Oh, sweet. Let's do Pastor Don first. <laughs> it's a new serum. Yeah, there you go. Okay. In honor of Pastor Appreciation Month and on behalf of the church council and you, the entire congregation, you didn't know this, but uh, you did it anyway. The Katharina Von Bora quilters were given the task of creating a lap quilt for each of the pastors. They were lovingly made by your favorite colors and with carefully selected scripture verses that are special to you. The prayer team then blessed each quilt with prayers for each of you. We hope that you feel blessed and much loved every time you use them. Uh, I like the Route 66, don't you? I think that's oh, very yeah. appropriate for him. I think it's time for Don to hit the road. Okay. <laughs> you put, lay it over the, yeah, there you go. And so there. Well, he's a busy man. He's got a lot of traveling to do. And I can't imagine what we chose oh, for Pastor yeah. Jack. Can you hold it up? A giant crying towel. A giant <laughs> crying towel. But every one of the 
scriptures are ones that we selected for you, but like I said, um, for both our pastors, and Pastor Eric, by the way, wasn't left out. He's being given one at the nine o'clock service. So uh, we hope that you feel blessed and much loved every time you use this token of our congregation's love and gratitude. Thank you very much. So we'll leave these there. We're going to leave these here so that those of you who, after the service, would like to see them. It not, is Chicago Bears. I'm not sure if that's sacrilegious or not. It but, probably uh, is. Well, yeah, no communion today, so that's a good thing, yeah. Um, this year, for our stewardship emphasis, uh, we came up with the theme, uh, God's Piece of the Pie. And, and hopefully you'll get a little more information about that in today's sermon and as we uh, travel together over the next couple weeks uh, looking at stewardship and heading towards Dedication Sunday in a couple weeks. And already I think letters have gone out and kind of explained to you, as we do every year, the importance of your generous support of our congregation uh, so that we can carry out our mission in ministry. Uh, this morning we have a fairly short video for you uh, from the stewardship team. Oh, I could. Well, maybe just a bite. Oh, yeah! All right! Don't forget the interest. the pie. I don't think I have to say any more about that. <laughs> this time I would invite you to go ahead and stand as you are able. Let us quiet our minds, center our hearts, prepare to come into the worship of our Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the only Sovereign, who dwells in light, Christ Jesus, who came to save sinners, the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Amen. 
God of overflowing grace, we come to you with repentant hearts. Forgive us for shallow thankfulness. Forgive us for passing by the ones in need. Forgive us for settling our hopes and fleeting treasures. Forgive us for neglect and thoughtlessness. Bring us home from the wilderness of sin and strengthen us to serve you in all that we do and say through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. There is joy in heaven over every sinner who repents. By the grace of God in Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for us all, our sins are forgiven, and we are made free. Rejoice with the angels and with one another. We are home in God's mercy now and forever. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, beloved children of God, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. God among us, we gather in the name of your Son to learn love for one another. Keep our feet from evil paths. Turn our minds to your wisdom and our hearts to the grace revealed in your Son. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our lesson today comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Now Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that his manager was wasting his possessions. And so he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in an account of your management, for you can no longer be my manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, 
Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly uh, and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. Now the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the sons of light. And I tell you, Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful with the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, how's that for a parable? This morning's Gospel reading... Sometimes that's been called the parable of the shrewd manager. Sometimes they call it the parable of the clever crook. No matter what you choose to name this parable, the fact remains that it is absolutely one of the most difficult of Jesus' parables to interpret. If you look at this parable just on the surface, it initially appears as if Jesus is suggesting through the parable that in some way he is advocating dishonest behavior. You know, the, the, manor, the master commends the shrewd manager for cheating him. Um, and then we have all this stuff about, you know, unrighteous mammon and, and the true riches. Um, it, it really is a very challenging uh, piece of scripture to wrap our, our heads around. Uh, let me be quick to point out to you that God is very clear throughout scripture how he feels about dishonesty. So if you think in some way this is uh, God's way of saying, well, it's, it's okay if you're dishonest in certain ways, um, but not in others, that's not the truth at all. I mean, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, put away all malice, all deceit. That means all kinds of deceit, as well as hypocrisy and envy and slander. Jesus is not condoning the behavior of the crooked manager. This is a parable. A parable is not something that is necessarily supposed to be taken literally. It's a story that is supposed to reflect a deeper meaning. Um, what Jesus is using in today's parable is something called hyperbole. Um, hyperbole is, it's been defined as obvious or intentional exaggeration or figure of speech, not intended to be taken literally, but rather to make a point or leave a lasting impression. So an example of hyperbole in scripture is, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy man to enter heaven. If you were to take that literally, how many camels do you know that can go through an eye of a needle? 
Zero. That means if you take it literally, how many wealthy people will be in heaven? Zero. See, it, it's a statement that is made, it's, it's to shock someone, to, to, to get their attention so that then Jesus can teach them something important. And sometimes in order to teach somebody something, you have to first get their attention. That's what this parable is about the crude manager or the clever crook. You can't help but start to hear that parable and hear about a manager who would commend a, a, a person working for them for stealing from them and go, what on earth is going on here? Now Jesus has our attention. This rather shocking story is told in order to get your attention. I hope it has, and to make it, uh, to make an important lasting impression. And that is this, uh, that the followers of Jesus need to be shrewd. They need to be shrewd if they are going to survive and thrive in this world. Not that they need to be dishonest in order to thrive in this world, but they need to be shrewd. They need to be clever. They need to be sharp. The word shrewd has been defined as using sound judgment and common sense. If you're going to survive in this world and do what God has called you to do in this world, you are going to have to use sound judgment and you're going to have to use common sense. So the point Jesus is really trying to get across is the importance of his follow followers using earthly wealth shrewdly, using it with sound judgment so that our earthly wealth ultimately accomplishes the will of God. This morning I'm going to focus in on three questions that are found in our gospel reading. These Three questions are found in verses 2, 3, and 5. In, in verse 2, we hear the first question, and that is the master who asks of the manager, what is this that I hear about you? In verse 3, we hear the second question, and that's the shrewd manager asking of himself, really, what am I going to do now? And, and finally, in verse 5, we hear the shrewd manager ask uh, the people who owe his master money, how much do you owe my master? So those are the three questions we're going to look at. What is this that I hear about you? What will I do now? And how much do you owe my master? Let's, let us now take a closer look at, at a very challenging parable in light of these three questions. Our first question is being asked by the master, is being directed at the one who in this case has been entrusted to care for the master's wealth. Do you think that might possibly be you? We, we have been entrusted with the wealth of the world. The master is the one, as, as the, the video pointed out, I don't know if you caught that little part where the one guy looks down the line and says, by the way, he brought the pie. He's the one who brought the pie, you know, and the guy just, well, yeah, you know, and then they all sort of dive in. Um, God has entrusted us with the pie. And, and, and what is it that he hears about us when it comes to what we're doing with that that he has entrusted with us. This question is one I think that strikes at the heart of every disciple of Jesus Christ. You and I know that we do not have a God who sits back and is uninterested in our daily affairs. In fact, we know that God is very concerned. He's very concerned about what's going on in our daily lives, what's going on in your life. He's very concerned about your joys. And he's very concerned about your sorrows. Uh, he's very concerned about um, the good times that are going on and wants to rejoice with you in them. And he's also very concerned about the bad times and the difficulties that you're going through. So it should not surprise us that we hear the master ask, what is this I hear about you? 
I'm interested in what's going on in your life. I care about what's going on in your life. What is this that I'm hearing about you? When it comes to our handling of wealth, that is the wealth that God has entrusted to our care. We're the manager. What do you think God is hearing about us? Is God hearing about how generous we are? Or is God hearing about how selfish we are? Is God hearing about lives that are being transformed and changed by our generosity? Or is God hearing about how the needs of others are being put on hold while you and I satisfy our own selfish desires? I imagine the results of that are as as big a variety as there are people in this room. And, And we know that when God asks the question, it's a rhetorical question. In other words, God isn't really wondering what's going on in your life. He already knows what's going on in your life. He's asking a rhetorical question. What is this do you think I hear about you? Um, The question is designed not to get information for God uh, uh, about our obedience to God. The question is designed to make us clearly aware that God cares. He cares what we're up to. And it's also a a question to remind us that God is keenly aware of where we are succeeding in life and where we are failing in life, and in particular, in our stewardship efforts. Now, how do we know God cares about what we do with the pie, the resources that he gives us? Note that the master in the parable says, Give me an account of your management. God says, you know, it's, it's not so much that God is keeping score as much as God is paying attention. God is um, basically saying, I want to do an audit. I want to see how things are going in your life. God cares about what we do with the financial and spiritual blessings that he's entrusted to our care. God takes a personal interest in our behavior. It's a very personal interest. He doesn't say, give, give you know, one of my archangels an accounting. He says, give me an accounting. And so the question is, if, if, if we, you and I, if we were to give God an honest accounting of our stewardship efforts, what we're doing with the things that God has blessed us with, not only financially, but our spiritual gifts and all those things. The question is, would the answer to that bring joy or sadness to God's heart? Would he be impressed or would he be disappointed? And I suppose the answer to that question also depends a bit on uh, what God's expectations of us are. So let's, let's think about that a little bit. What is it exactly that God expects of us? Um, And that's important because otherwise we're just kind of, you know, flailing in the dark out there and God doesn't want that. Um, Keep in mind, keep that in mind, uh, that, that what is it that God expects of us? Because That's what we're going to begin to deal with in the next question. The second question up for consideration this morning is uh, one that the shrewd manager asks of of himself, but one that each of us needs to ask now too. That God has said, uh, give me an accounting, and, and our response is, what will I do now? Once we have a sense that God is concerned about our management of of the wealth and the spiritual gifts that he's given us, it's then appropriate that we ask, what should I do now? Now, fortunately for us, God gives us very clear direction in how he expects us to handle all this personal wealth and spiritual gifts that he has entrusted to our care. We don't have to guess. This is where our stewardship theme for this year comes into sharper focus. God's piece of the pie. And by the way, um, when we're done with the service today and you go out, you'll find at the tables outside, um, guess what? Pie. There's a, there's a lot of pie. So even if you're going out to breakfast, stop. Grab a piece of pie. Um, 
The whole idea of, of those pies, well, I'll get back to that, but those pies are divided up, just as they are divided up for the people in the video. Um, the, the difference is, is that for each pie that we brought today and divided up, um, a piece of the pie was reserved for God. It's a reminder to us that we don't get to keep the whole pie. Well, we can if we want to, but that's not what God wants. That, so what are they going to do with that? All that extra pie is going to my house. <laughs> and I'm putting it in the freezer. I'm going to be eating pie for years. Now we're going to use that pie. We're going to be serving that pie uh, at the Sunday evening meal. Um, I mean, it's, it's reflective, isn't it, of what we're supposed to use our gifts to be a blessing to others. So, um, you know, there is a method to our madness here. Um, the fact is, all that we have is a blessing from God. You can argue that point all you want, but you're arguing with God over that. God says, I am the creator of the pie, and I am the giver of the pie, and, and there would be no pie without me. All that we have is a blessing from God. So if one is using a pie as a metaphor for God's care, then everything that we have is, uh, is a pie that God has entrusted to our care. So let's be clear about this. God does not give us our blessings for us to do with as we please. In fact, God doesn't really give us the pie at all. Um, the truth is, what God does is... He loans you a pie. He, and, and he loans you that pie throughout your life. And if you ever doubt that it's a loan, just ask yourself how much of the pie you get to take with you when you leave this world. Okay, everything you have is on loan from God. Your car's on loan from God. Your home's on loan from God. Every day of your life, every hour, every moment, every second is God loaning that blessing to you. God doesn't give us anything. He, lo he loans us everything. We are not free to do as we please with what God has entrusted to our care. In other words, God expects us to use the gifts that he's entrusted to our care in a manner that serves and glorifies God. Um, I'm going to say that again. God expects us to use our pie in a manner that serves and glorifies him. So he may entrust the pie to us, but you better believe he cares what we do with that pie. God communicates his will, his expectations to us in two ways. So if you're confused about what does God want me to do with this pie that he's placed in my hands, he, first of all, he gives you an example. And the second thing he does is in case there's any confusion, he just tells you, this is what I want you to do. But first, let's look at, at uh, God, God's example. Uh, God shows us that we are to be generous in the sharing of our spiritual gifts and financial blessings. If you look at the course of history, all throughout the scriptures, what, what's one thing you can kind of peel back of everything that God is doing in the world, and you have to come back to the same thing over and over again, God is a generous God. Um, in the Old Testament, he shares his love for us immediately by our creation. And he continues to, to generously lavish upon us forgiveness that we don't deserve. So Adam and Eve should have been, you know, but instead he removes them from the garden. But the first thing he does after he removes them from the garden is he goes out and kills the animal to get the skin to take care of them. Even in his punishment, God is there being generous. You know, throughout the Old Testament, whether you're talking about the, the people on the way to the promised land or what they're doing in the wilderness, God is always there, always taking care of them, always meeting their needs, always giving them a hope and a dream to hang on. When they get to the promised land and all the, the 
terrible kings that defy God and worship Baal and do all these things. Yes, there are consequences for our behavior, but a generous God preserves the nation of Israel and brings them back from exile to reestablish them in their land. Over and over and over again, God shows his generous love to us that we don't deserve, and ultimately that comes to fruition on the cross. Right? And yet that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The ultimate example of God's generosity is he gives the very life of his beloved son on the cross so that we can know eternal life with him. We have a generous God. I mean, Scripture is clear. But in case there's any, any, anything of you know, confusion about that, he, he wants us to understand that um, he wants to be a priority in our life. And, and he also wants us to think proportionally. And, and he does this through Scripture. So we're not confused. In Deuteronomy, in Leviticus, uh, what God says he commands of his people is that they give the first fruits of their harvest back to him. Now, what does God mean when he says, I want the first fruits of your harvest? Well, the first fruits of the harvest are oftentimes the very best part of the harvest. Um, so what God is saying, first of all, is... I don't want your leftovers. In other words, if you're looking at that piece of the pie thing, the real way to approach the pie is this. You slice up the pie, and the first piece of the pie goes to God. Right away. God doesn't want the leftovers. He wants to make sure he's a priority in your life. He's the number one thing. And that's why the commandment says, remember, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me, no other things before me. I, I'm a jealous God. I want to be the number one thing in your life. Don't make me a leftover, a leftover thought or a leftover anything else. Secondly, by giving of the first fruits of the harvest, you know, it's, it, those of you who have been farmers or were raised on a farm, or you know how this goes. Um, it comes time for the harvest. And you're anxiously looking to the sky. Now, in, in Montana, it's a lot of dry land wheat farming. So, um, and, and a lot of times the, the harvest just comes around hail season, and there's a lot of other different things out there. And you're always looking to the sky, always wondering about the storm, or always wondering if the rains are going to do this or do that or whatever. So when it comes time for the harvest, you may start your harvest, but there's no guarantee you'll get your harvest done. I mean, something could happen. The locusts could come, the hail could come, the storms could come. But what God says is, you go in, you do the harvest, you give me the first fruits of the harvest, and what you're saying to me is this, I trust you, God, with the first fruits. I know that if I give the best and the first to you, you will meet all of my needs. No matter what comes down the road, I trust you, Lord. So God becomes a priority. Um, now, somebody say, okay, well, just how many slices are there to that pie? Are there six slices to the pie or are there two slices to the pie? Do I give half to God, half to me? And the remarkable thing is God says, I don't want you to have to guess. I'm going to tell you very specifically this is how it works. Again, from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. What God asks is that we, we return to him 10% of the harvest, 10% of the pie. That's called in Scripture a tithe. Now, when you say, well, I tithe to the Lord, and you think of that as, that's the check I write every week, I want to make it clear, you're sharing with the Lord whatever you give. And, and he, is, uh, he is happy with whatever, wherever you're at, but I want to make it clear what a tithe is and what a tithe is not. A tithe is 10%. Now, you can argue with me, is that pre-tax or post-tax? And I'm saying to you, if that's the argument you want to have, you're already in really good shape. Okay? I have no problem looking at a Christian and saying a tithe is 10% after you've paid off your taxes to the government or whatever. 
I don't have a problem with that. Some other pastors might. I'm just saying if you're asking which 10% pre or post tax, you know, 10% is 10%. You can figure it out. You can pray and talk to God about it. So that's why I encourage Christians. I know that's a hard place for a lot of Christians to go. And, and, and so that's why we talk about growing in our giving. You know, where are you at now? Where is the tithe? How far, how close are you to the tithe? And then I just ask people to trust God and to give a little more each year until you grow into the tithe. Now, I have never known a tither who quit being a tither. Now, some of you might send me an email later, le, le, later and let me know that was the case or something, but I've personally never known a tither who quit being a tither. Why is that? Because what tithers find out is you can't outgive God. And the more that you trust God and the more that you give God, you will be absolutely amazed. And Scripture even tells you, I will give you tenfold whatever you think you will give me. You will be blessed. Your cup will overflow. It's just, he says, in fact, God even says, you don't believe that? Put me to the test and see if I won't follow through. I mean, it's an amazing thing. But I would encourage you to work toward the tithe in your life. That's God's proportional amount. And, and, it's, and it's fair, I guess. It's just like the more you've been blessed, you know, if you're a Bill Gates, you know, 10% is a lot of money. But then Bill Gates has been blessed a lot, right? And, and if you are a person living on, uh, you know, a rather limited income, 10% uh, is a lot to you too. But God says, just trust me. Do the 10%, watch me blow your mind. That's proportional giving. So then we come to the third question in our scripture lesson, which is, um, how much do you owe my master? Uh, how much do we owe our Father in heaven? The, the only point I want to make here is this. What we owe God is everything. You know, if you look at Scripture, what does God say? The greatest commandment is, love the Lord your God with 10% of your heart, 10% of your mind, 10% of your strength. No. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. The truth of the matter is, we owe God everything. The amazing generosity of God is, he says, ah, heck, keep 90% of it. He says, you know, I can accomplish whatever I want to accomplish in this world with 10% of the pie. I'm God. Believe me, I got it covered. The 10% isn't so much that God really needs your 10%. What God is really doing is he's challenging your loyalty. He's challenging your trust. He's challenging your obedience. He's just saying, show me, show me that you really understand that this is all a blessing from God and that God wants to bless you in return. So, which brings us back to that question, what will I do now? You know, for me, I think the struggle always has been fear and insecurity. Um, I'm no different than any of you. Uh, you know, I have my fears and my insecurities. I, you know, I wonder about my retirement years. I, you know, I wonder, you know, I've got kids who are sometimes like, like a giant black sucking hole, you know. They, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Lord knows I love them, but they, I, could, I could throw money at them and it would, it would just be endless. Um, and they're good kids, but you know, it's, it's hard out there today. It's, it, even if you're working hard and full time and trying to make it, you know, I got a daughter who lives in Anaheim for crying out loud, you know, going to school. You know, so there's always something to be fearful about or insecure about and demanding on your, your funds and all those things. I understand that. And I understand that that's, that's a challenge for each of us to overcome. 
Or, you know, how long am I going to live? And will I have enough to get me through to my old age? Or will I be able to leave enough for my children? Um, But what God is asking us to do is help him help us overcome our fear. Help him help us overcome our insecurity. And so I just want to encourage you, you know, to think about this proportional giving thing. To think about tithing. To think about where you're at. To think about, pray about, you know, what it would take for you, you know, to become a tither. What it would take for you to become a first fruits giver. Where the first check you write or the first deposit that you you make um, each month is one that goes to the mission and ministry of the gospel rather than some other bill. I'm going to close today's sermon with a a parable. Um, And you may have heard it before, but it's a good one, and and I think it's appropriate. And it's called the parable of the two seas. There are two seas in the Holy Land, right? The Sea of Galilee, and there is the Dead Sea. Now, one of these seas is fresh, and lots of fish live in it. Its shores are surrounded by lush green vegetation. The River Jordan flows into this sea. Its sparkling waters coming down out of the mountains and the hills. Uh, the, the people build their houses around the Sea of Galilee. Birds nest there. The fields around it are irrigated and green and beautiful. And, and, and life is good there. Then the River Jordan flows out of the Sea of Galilee further south into another sea. Now in that other sea, there are no fish at all. And there's no green along its shores, there's no houses, there's no birds nesting nearby, no fields are fed by its waters because its waters are too foul for animals and people to drink. But what is the difference between these two seas in the Holy Land? It's not the River Jordan, the River Jordan flows into both seas. It empties its good water into both. But here's the difference. The first sea, the Sea of Galilee, receives and it also then gives. For everything that flows into the Sea of Galilee, out the other side flows in equal measure. And in the giving and in the receiving, the Sea of Galilee receives its life. The other sea... The Dead Sea receives. It receives all that beautiful water coming down out of the Sea of Galilee, out of the mountains, all that. It receives it, and then it just hangs on to it. It doesn't go anywhere else. It just gets there and stays there, and it becomes foul. So, what are you feeling more like today? The fresh sea of the Sea of Galilee or the Dead Sea? Let the life of our Lord Jesus Christ flow into you, but also let it flow out from you in hope and in promise today. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, I would invite you to go ahead and stand. We'll sing our hymn of the day out of the green hymnals, number 406.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we invite the ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. May our God of all provision instill in us a true and faithful spirit of generosity.
rejoicing in the Spirit's work among us, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Our Lord and our Master, through your Spirit, give us pure and abundantly generous hearts so that we can offer ourselves as living sacrifices that are holy and pleasing to you. We want to willingly and joyfully give of our time, talents, and resources so that our gifts and our service to you are in keeping with your master plan. Free us from being enslaved by all worldly traps and help us to learn that we have nothing to fear. We, we entrust all that we are and all that we have into your keeping. Hear us, O oh God. God of infinite mercy, provide comfort and peace to Larry and Craig Berghofer and friends on the passing of their mother and our dear sister in Christ, Alice Berghofer. Provide healing mercies to all who have been hospitalized. Provide tender hearts who are able to provide shelter and aid for those in the path of the hurricanes. Extend your grace and mercy to be on those who are impoverished and broken in spirit, especially those that we silently name in our hearts at this time. Hear us, O oh God. Hear Living Word, bless each of our pastors at American Lutheran Church with health and with wholeness. Lighten their burdens and renew their spirits. Help us to see our pastors as you see them and to love them as our Christian brothers and caretakers of our souls. Teach us to choose our words wisely and to build them up through helpful service and encouraging words. Please pour out your blessings and favor upon their individual families and on our church family. Hear us, O oh God. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive God's blessing. God Almighty, send you light and truth to keep you all the days of your life. May the hand of God protect you. May the holy angels of God accompany you. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. Amen.